Hey there, fight fans. Welcome to the UFC on ESPN3 in Ganu versus Dos Santos post fight show brought to you by SB Nation MMA, which is a cooperative effort between BloodyElbow.com and MMAMania.com, the only two websites on the planet you'll ever need to visit if you're looking to find out what's happening in mixed martial arts. I'm your host, as always, Flying Brian J, and joining me. This time is just one of one of the members of the six round post fight show. I call him Mr. Positivity. His name is Eddie Mercado. Eddie, we just watched. Wait a second. Let me get something out of the way. Viewers, I I don't mean to be preachy like Luke Thomas or something to you, but if you're clicking on a link that says post fight show, you've got to expect that the people on that show are going to talk about the results. So, I'm not going to warn you about spoilers from now on, but that was your warning. Here are the spoilers. Francis Ngannou put Junior Dos Santos down in a minute and 11 seconds. Eddie, is Ngannou the scariest man on the planet? Uh, first, got to say happy birthday to Major Zane. Uh, he's probably like 300 years old or something, and I'm sure he went back to his home planet of Remulac to Norfolk the Garthok, as he always does. So big shout out to him. Uh, he'll definitely be missed in his expert analysis. Um, I'm sorry. Would you ask me? Oh, Nagano is he scary? <laughs> Fucking a, he's scary. No, is he he's the like... scariest man on the planet? Um. Uh, um. Hmm. I see you don't like working in uh, definites, but. Maybe. Well, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. No, he's not because I've seen him lose. But like John Jones takes the cake for me. John Jones is the fattest man on the planet, bar none. Hmm. Like, I would not pick a soul over John Jones. I've seen Naganu lose. I've never seen John Jones really lose. So he's close, though. Naganu's there. He's probably like number two. And, like, I don't know. Rumble Johnson is pretty freaking scary. I know he doesn't really fight anymore, but. Well, we saw him lose, and we saw him, you know, kind of give up. Even in those fights that Nganu lost, he didn't give up. He got kind of timid after losing that decision to Stipe Miocic against Derek Lewis. But now he has his swagger back. The swagger back version of Nganu is the one. What's great is, like, this is an example of what happens when we can get a super athlete in the UFC. Mm-hmm. And I, they, they touched on this in, in, I think it was John Anik, but during the commentary, they said that Naganu, had he been born in the States, he probably would have been, you know, chasing down a quarterback, you know, in the NFL, which is true. And he would probably be making better money <laughs> and just all around have a better life. But anyways, um, this is like a, a glimpse of what could happen if we did have super athletes competing in the ufc because i mean the the puncher's chance just amplifies so much and i love that it's like what's going on in the light heavyweight division should be going on in heavyweight division but we just don't have those freak athletes and naganu is the exception so we have naganu and you know he's he scores these very quick minute knockouts and that is very scary like that's that's great. And it, it really just makes me wish we, there was more money in the sport that that would draw out the to the point where the most talented guys are also the most athletic. And that's not the case. Like, Naganu is not the most technical guy out there. But when you couple that with his, his raw power and the technique he does have, it's enough. <laughs> Like, it's enough. Well, you even mentioned his uh, he's got that puncher's chance. The punches that he knocked Junior Dos Santos out with tonight were kind of wide and winging. The first one uh, was a, a left hook that kind of clipped Junior behind the ear as soon as Junior kind of fell down from the overhand right. And they're just kind of coming wide. They're not coming sharp and straight, but he's got dynamite in those hands. I hate to spit out hyperbole, but, man, he connects with any kind of punch, no matter how – wide and loopy and kind of sloppy it is sleeping and but i mean junior santos has shown a little bit of uh, wear and tear in the past few years but yikes that was some scary stuff i worry about daniel cormier potentially fighting francis and 
in the post-fight interview after knocking out JDS in just a minute and 11 seconds, he called out the winner of Stipe Miocic versus Daniel Cormier, which I think that he deserves that fight. Will he get it? I don't know. It depends on, like you talked about, your scariest man on the planet, John Jones. If he were to go up to heavyweight, potentially and fight Cormier if he beats Miocic again, that fight would take precedence over DC versus Nganu. But what do you think about Nganu's chances against Miocic in a rematch or Daniel Cormier if Cormier gets past Miocic again? Not enough time has gone by for Naganu to fill in the gaps in terms of the technical wrestling ability. So it, it, there's a good chance to be more of the same. But the puncher's chance is so amplified with Naganu that, like, you know, Stipe getting melted by DC doesn't isn't good. It's not like it's not like Miasic is going to come in more durable than before. So the likelihood of Naganu getting a knockout increases, if anything. So there's that. And did you ask me get him against DC? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For real? I mean, pff, puncher's chance. Like that's it. That's a that's such a high level of wrestling that Naganu has not shown that he can. He has any kind of answers for that whatsoever. And and like I said, not a lot of time has gone by. So there's no. There's no reason for me to believe that he has all of a sudden just miraculously learned how to, you know, counter wrestle to the point where he can do anything to fight off Stipe Miocic or Daniel Cormier. So those will probably end. Those will probably be more the same. DC might get the finish, but DC uh, Stipe will probably get another decision if they fought and if he doesn't get knocked down. Yes. What about you? What do you think? I don't know. I like Daniel Cormier a lot because uh, he's, a, he's a great guy. He seems like a good dad, I think a good coach, all-around great human being. Plus, I love his commentary. So I like him a lot. I'm kind of blinded by that. And when I like a fighter a lot, I, I worry about them getting knocked out. And I know that you talk about the puncher's chance and how it's amplified because Ngannou's an athlete. It's amplified because of the heavyweight division. It's It's – it's amplified like Cormier has to close that distance. He has to. And in that space, like so it could be Cormier getting a rear naked choke like he did on uh, Derek Lewis. It could also be like an eight-second knockout because Cormier absolutely has to close the distance. He can't be at distance with him. I mean, he can be way the heck out here or way in here, but it's that middle space where I would super worry about Daniel Cormier's chances. I would like to see the rematch with Miacic if – John Jones were to decide to go up to to heavyweight and have the trifecta with Daniel Cormier, that'd be a lot of fun. But I I don't know. Part of me also thinks that after the Miocic fight, Cormier might retire. He said he was going to retire this year in March because he turned forty, right? But then he put that off to to rematch Miocic and maybe fight Brock Lesnar. I think that it, we might just see Cormier retire. Tonight on the broadcast, they revealed that Cormier's got this new series. It's called Detailed Inside the Mind of Daniel Cormier, where he breaks down some high-profile fighters. His first one is going to be, or is, Amanda the Lioness Nunes. He's got that set up for him. He's got the commentary set up for him. I think he's already kind of moving himself out. Yeah, setting himself up for a life after fighting, that's for sure. And, like, that's cool. I'm happy to see that. Like, anyone who wants to go out on top is cool with me. I, this is a sport where all of our heroes will eventually get the snot beat out of them, and it's tough to watch, but it 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 is what it is, and that's why I love Floyd Mayweather so much because he's such an exception to that rule, and it's such a hard rule. So it's it's nice to see guys go out when they're on top, and DC has a chance to do it as long as he doesn't get that John Jones trilogy fight, which doesn't really need to happen for any kind of like. You know, like DC lost in every way, shape, or form. There's no, yeah, there's twice. no real need for it outside of they just don't like each other. And like it would probably do numbers, just because you know who wouldn't want to watch two of the greatest go at it at any weight. Yeah, it'd do gigantic numbers. You mentioned that it's not very often that we see our heroes or our favorite fighters get out of the sport before. You know, it's a, it's a sport where brain damage is imminent, essentially. One of my favorite commenters on my live play-by-play -play tonight said that 
he could see the main event of Ngannou versus JDS ending one of two ways. JDS kind of jabbing and moving his way to a decision or by getting CTE. And I, I know that's pretty severe, but he was kind of right. Yeah, that was tough, man. JDS, he just overcommitted. He overcommitted to that overhand right, and then his defense was running away, and Naganu wasn't going to let him get away with that, and he punished him for it. And he capitalized on it, and once he had him hurt, he didn't let him off the hook and just punished him until he got the finish. So Naganu, he, he wants a title shot. He wants the belt. He is beyond capable his his punching power is just it's an x factor that just compensates for a lot like at heavyweight the chin is really the most important factor if you don't have a chin you're you're really going to struggle to consistently win fights you know there's a lot of glass cannons floating around at heavyweight look at Alistair Overeem mm-hmm. all the talent in the world all the skills you know, all the techniques, both on the feet and on the ground, but his chin has been his Achilles heel. And you can't do that at heavyweight. But with Naganu, he is so powerful that nobody's chin can really stand up to it. But it's all of a, it's all a matter of whether or not he can touch that chin. Stipe got around it. Derek Lewis, like, I don't even know what happened in that. That was like a time loop or something. Like, I don't know. That was like the stare off. The stare down got caught in a time loop. That was one of the worst fights I've ever seen. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah, if you can just stay away or if you can just – if you can stay away from him or if you can just be 100% all up on him and you're that much of a better wrestler, you can you can beat him. He's beatable, but – Man, he's powerful. Let me get uh, some of these comments of, from the live chat in here. Kyle Mungari says that Ngannou has only been in the sport for four years, and he's only getting better. That's absolutely true. And Lee the Flea says, dang it. I feel bad for Junior Dos Santos. I think that people who've been watching the sport for a long time know that JDS is a seems like a decent human being. He's a former champion, and we all feel a little bit bad for him. I honestly feel a little bit bad for everybody that gets knocked out in a high-profile spot. But, Eddie, I want to use your your talk about Chin being the most important thing at heavyweight as a way to segue into our co-main event of the evening where the flyweight division is not known for knockout finishes or, or things of the sort, but Joseph Benavidez for the second time against Juicy Formiga provided us with a TKO finish. This one came from a head kick and follow-up punches at 447 of round number two, setting himself up for a title fight against newly minted triple champ, 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 extraordinaire Henry the Messenger Cejudo. It was a pretty fun fight, back and forth at times. Uh, Juicy A landed some pretty solid right hands on Benavidez, regardless of the thumb in the eye. He did damage the left eye of Benavidez. What do you think about Joseph Benavidez's performance? And these are like two of the ten guys left in the flyweight division, a division that I love. What do you think of the prospects of the flyweights and and just your thoughts on Joseph's performance tonight? I think Joey B looked really sharp. I think he, he was doing really, really well in the grappling exchanges. Formiga was unable to just secure anything. And Benavides was able to secure top position for a little bit. And then, of course, that finishing sequence was savage. You know, he set up that head kick really nicely and followed up with just pure savagery. And it really puts him in a great position since he already holds a win over Cejudo. And I think they should just fight at 130 pounds and put both belts on the line and the gold medal. F it. Why not? (laughs) Yeah, let's put let's put it all out there. I thought it was really cool in the post fight interview from Benavides. He said, "Just call me Joey two time." He beat Dustin Ortiz two times. He beats Juicy A Formiga two times, and he's about to beat Henry Cejudo for the second time. You want me to? You want me to go there? You 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 want me to be that guy? Sure. He lost to Demetrius Johnson two times. <laughs> well, but none of that says one and one, and he already has the win. Over oh, wait Cejudo. a minute. He lost to Dominic Cruz two times. Oh man! So so it's true. At least I mean, it's that's beyond just, true. It's more for evidence. better or worse. 
Yeah. I love Joseph Benavides, though. I'm so glad he won this. Yeah. Let him win. And, like, if he wins, if he wins at 125, does he go up to 135 and they go a third time? I like, hope not. Do? I hope not. Depending on how exciting, like, the 125-pound title fight would be, I don't like seeing immediate rematches, just, you know, back-to-back. -back. No matter how close the first one was, I want – I like – newness we're not in this sport for monogamy let's let's mix it up well you're you're in the wrong you're in the wrong sport you just said we just got done talking about how benavides fought the same person twice on like six different occasions no, but not back to back like rematches are fine just back to back yeah, okay. rematches that's what you're saying so if if they fight at 125 and joe b wins they and they ran it back immediately at 135 like they did with uh well they were going to do with tj and henry I don't, I don't, I don't need it. You know, give me some time to like. Oh yeah, that fight was awesome. And then, what have they turned into since? But if they do it back to back, you have nothing to take away from it. Well, I disagree. I think you do have something to take away. And what you take away is the flyweight division. <laughs> You're not a fan. I'm not right? even kidding. Because like, who else is there? Who else is there to compete for the flyweight title outside of Benavides? Uh, the number one guy just got taken out. Let's just let's take a peek at the old rankings and see what uh, are they even on? They are here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They gotta be. Tim Elliott. Ooh, Kai Kara France. Yeah. Come on, Brasov. Some serious stuff, dude. Come on, Brasov. Like the division's dead. So, like it's sad. Look at it. There's only twelve ranked. <laughs> uh, well, that's so. Yeah, I think that's what you do. You keep trying to. Uh, well, if Benavides loses, the division dies. If Benavides wins, he can be a champ champ and let, I don't know, Pantoja get a title shot and just slowly just keep weeding out the the flyweights, keep sending them all to, to one championship. I don't know. I, don't I like know. the it's flyweight division. They provide um, high-paced action, fun scrambles. We even saw the, the fun scrambles happen with – Benavides and Formiga tonight. Like you said, Formiga kept like almost getting top position, and then somehow Benavides would end up on top. Even one time, uh, we had Formiga from the bottom trying to go for like the half guard sweep, similar to what Damian Maya does. Um, but Benavides was able to just go north south and then get on top of him. It was, and that's that's some real flyweight shit too. Mm -hmm. You know, that's you don't see that in the heavier divisions. They're just the anatomy of flyweights is so different. It's it's going to be missed when it's gone, but like let's stop it pretending like it's not going away just because Dana said it's staying because Cejudo's a champ champ. I'm gonna hold on. I'm gonna hold on to the dream, Eddie. I'm gonna keep that there. Maybe okay. Here's well, what the... if you're gonna do that, then answer me this: mm -hmm. Where's number 13, 14, and fifteen on this official UFC.com rankings list? They are going to be signed from Dana White's Contender Series in the next few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just I'm what I was hoping is maybe it's true is like they were like, well, this group of flyweights just aren't selling. Get rid of them all, bring in a new cast. I'm like, just screw it. Nobody's paying close enough attention to these fighters. Bring in all new ones. We're starting a new season with all new characters and nobody's going to notice. Maybe that's what Uncle Dana's doing. But I mentioned um that Juicy A was trying for that half guard sweep. Similar, similar to what Damian Maya does. Let's use that and to take us into talking about Damian Maya versus Anthony Rocco Martin. It was read on the scorecards immediately after that Damian Maya had won a unanimous decision. They came back later and told us that somebody can't add three numbers together properly, and it was actually a majority decision because one guy had a 29 or 28, 28 draw because Damian Maya did nothing, absolutely nothing in the third round. He circled to his left and. He didn't even fake strikes, just nothing. What did you think of Damian Maya's performance tonight? Classic Damian Maya. He did enough to win the fight, technically. So, you know. But did you enjoy it? Um. Um. Hmm. I enjoyed it because I wanted to see if if Rocco could 
overcome the grappling and find a way to get the knockout. That kept me on my head, on the edge of my seat and like excited to see. But once once Rocker got down, I knew he was staying down. So like the second round bummed me out because I was expecting more than what I got. But like Martin went for it there in the third. Like he, he rocked Maya, went for it, but he just couldn't stay disengaged long enough to really string anything together to do some fight ending damage came close but it just wasn't enough speaking of going for it what do you think about a uh, rocco martin going for two guillotines in round number two instead of getting his hips away pushing the head to the mat he i mean maybe he thought i can't get this done any other way i gotta go for this guillotine but i didn't think it was a, the best thing to do he needed to just keep the fight on the feet where he rocked him in the third round but what do you think about him going going for those guillotine chokes oh man i think i understand why he did it it's like if he felt like he was gonna be getting taken down anyways maybe he can use the guillotine to use the momentum to kind of keep the to roll maya and get on top and he's got wicked guillotines and like it, it might be hard to resist that, you know? If you can be someone who... If you submit Damian Maya, like, what's cooler than that? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose, yeah. In short, I thought the fight was rather lame. Damian Maya only landed two significant strikes in the whole 15 minutes, and he won by getting Rocco Martin down and holding him in staff pose for 75% of the 15-minute bout. Not that great. Let's I liked it. I mean, I, I, I guess, I don't know. Maybe I'm weird. I, I fucking liked it. <laughs> no, but that's good, because that's why you're here. Mr. Positivity. I was just... I did, was, did, have you have you seen Damian Maya versus Jake Shields? I Yeah, but I don't remember it. Oh, uh, okay. That answers my question. I love that fight. Like, absolutely love it. And I don't even know if a single punch was thrown. So, like, you might be like, oh, man, that fight sucked. And you don't even remember it. So, like, obviously it didn't stick out to you. But I love that fight. But you have to be a grapple head to, like, really appreciate what's going on there. I thought there was a long stretch of time in the second round. Well, with, like, 15 seconds to go in the round, the referee did stand him up. But when Damian Maya wasn't throwing any – wasn't trying to improve his position, wasn't trying for anything, just holding Martin in staff pose at the end of the second round. And I'm like, referee, what – what do we do? Like, I like grappling when they're trying to improve their position. They're trying to work for submissions or do anything at all. But Maya was just holding him there. Like, what the heck, man? You know? Um, Yeah, I like Damian Maya, though. He's always been a favorite of mine. And I can't believe he's still fighting. Talk about longevity. Like, he's... It's, it's amazing that he's still at it. And that might be a testament to jujitsu and like his style and his willingness to just not brawl with people. Well, I think and like how bad of an idea that is. Uh, I forget. I think it was after he submitted Carlos Condit when, like Condit said that one strike on the ground that Maya hit him with like was one of the most jarring strike he he had ever been hit with. And Maya countered with like, "Whoa, whoa, man! My goal is like to make people not want to fight anymore without like actually hurting them." So, yeah, that's a testament to his style, which is very admirable. And he is kind of a unique player in this game of mixed martial arts where he's got that specific style. It's um, the, the gentle art, which is which is pretty cool. It just it just lacked a little something-something in that fight tonight. But let's skip down from Vince Pichel uh, decisioning Roosevelt Roberts to Drew Dober knocking out Marco Polo Reyes. I think that has to be one of the highlights of the night. He... Drew, in the post-fight, said that he went in there not, he, knowing that he has power in his hands. He just wanted to uh, get his foot on the outside, throw some hooks, and touch Polo Reyes. And touch he did. He finished him in a minute and seven seconds, and every single strike that he threw seemed like it had a lot behind it. If that's just touching, I'd love to see him throw in full force. Yeah, I mean, he straight up stormed his castle. <laughs> He he stormed his castle, and that was that was good to see. Cause I like Drew Dober. He seems like a chill guy. Seems like someone you would want to have a beer with, and like he's, I don't know. He's just never been really a complete fighter, and he hasn't really been a consistent fighter. But oddly enough, 
he's won like four of his last five. And it's like, wait a minute, when did when did this happen? Like, when did you when did you all of a sudden start stringing together, a, you know, a bit of a streak? But here he is, you know, four of his last five. Like, who would have who remembers him winning that much? Yeah, and two of those are knockouts, and one of them was a fight of the night. I think of him as more of a decision guy. I picked him on Verdict MMA for a decision, and he goes out there and just, like you said, storms the castle. Went right over the moat, dropped down the drawbridge, and whooped his ass. Yeah, it was good to see. It was good to see out of Dober. Because, like, he's got, he's got some really pretty striking but sometimes it's a little heavy. It's a little more on the volume side and not so much on the power side. So it was nice to see his hands really do some serious damage out there. And it was just right away. Like, Polo Reyes had zero moments in this. Like, none. Yeah. And I, I, bet, I wonder if, if Dober's going to win a performance bonus. Uh, June's usually here by now to tell us what the real post-fight bonuses were, but on the main card... Okay, let's talk about Alonzo Menafield, Paul Craig, and then we'll talk about our our imaginary post-fight bonuses, if that's okay with you, Eddie. Alonzo Menafield goes out there against Paul Craig. Craig wanted to pull guard because he's won, like, two of his last four, two of his last three fights uh, off of his back later on in fights. He's got really good jiu-jitsu. Well, no, he, he pulled guard because he's not a, a, a really good striker, so he had no business trying to strike it out on the feet. That's why he pulled guard, because we saw what happens when he does try to strike on his feet. He gets overconfident when he lands an insanely slow spinning <laughs> wheel kick that he throws another one and gets absolutely melted for it. So that's why he pulled guard. <laughs> well, Not because yeah. he won his last two fights by Hail Mary submissions, but because his striking is really not good in terms of the UFC. So he, it, he has to pull guard. Because jujitsu is his path to victory. So. Yeah, yeah, so he was trying to pull guard for, for his path to victory. But yeah, he, he went for a spinning heel kick, landed it, goes for a spinning back kick, missed it completely, falls down, eats three right hands from Alonzo Menafield. Alonzo throws a fourth one over the back of Herb Dean. Nobody even talked about it, which was, it's fine. Um, Paul Craig didn't seem to mind it. But Alonzo Menafield looks to be... A force to be reckoned with at 205 pounds. In, in a completely shallow division where we need these big athletic dudes, he looks to be somebody to watch. Mm hmm. I mean, it's the division where athleticism reigns supreme. Like we said, chin at heavyweight. Well, it's athleticism at 205. And Minifield has that. And he's willing to be a savage. And that's what he was here. He had to be aggressive and he had to be the bully. And. You know, he it, he worried me at first when he was so willing to, to engage in the clinch and his corner is screaming for him to disengage and he just refused to listen. And then he finally was like, all right, all right, enough of this. Let me disengage and let me keep my distance and refuse to play his game. So he smartened up when I thought he was about to display some low fight IQ. He, he straightened up, listened to his corner, and really just uh, made the most when he saw his opportunity. And uh, he probably he probably got pissed off when that slow-ass wheel kick hit him in the face. He's like, oh, hell no. Nah. <laughs> like, this dude is not about to be wheel kicking me in the face. Like, do it again. And then he did it again. He's like, yeah, boom. That's probably like, the worst time to throw it again. <laughs> and actually, Paul had landed that thing twice before the, the one that went to the body the, that he fell down from. He landed the spinning heel on the guard the first time. It was a little better the second time. And then the third one is what got him crushed. So, yeah, maybe he was like this <laughs> this slow son of a gun. But I like Paul Craig. He's a funny character in, in yeah. mixed martial arts. The Bear Jew is, <clears throat> is a funny nickname. Alonzo seems like he's a funny guy on the microphone, but refused to call anybody out in the post fight. I would have liked it if he would have utilized his mic time as well as Amanda Rebus did earlier in the night. Nonetheless, I look forward to his next contest. Eddie, let's talk about our post-fight bonuses. We give out five, or a total of $250,000, because we're not actually giving anybody any money at all. So, who would you give 
uh, your performance bonuses too. You can give out five performance bonuses or one fight of the night, three performance bonuses, two fights of the night, one performance bonus, whatever you want to do. Would you want to know the real ones first or you want to give out some? I'm going to go through mine first. Well, let me see. So I'm going to give out one. I'm going to give out two. I'm going to give out three. I'm going to give out four and I'm going to give out five. So it's pretty obvious, I think. So Naganu, of course, you know, a minute and 11 second knockout of JDS, former champ. Insanely awesome. That's special shit. Uh, Joey B doing it once again, knocking out Formiga for the second time. That was cool shit. Drew Dober coming out and storming the castle of Polo Reyes, like we said, in a minute and seven seconds. That's awesome. Alonzo Minifield uh, capitalizing on someone going to the wheel kick well too many times. And, of course, your boy, Eric Anders, going full savage tonight, uh, scoring a knockout in one minute and 18 seconds. So all of them, I believe, deserve... $50,000, $50,000, if not more, actually more, make it 500000 a piece. <laughs> that seems like more suitable. And like, it's sad that we even laugh at that. Like we said, we need the super athletes attracted to the sport, multi-million dollar deals. So that way they can start training from a younger age. They go into wrestling, they go into jujitsu, get into boxing, get into Muay Thai, and then by the time they're adults, they're full-fledged martial artists and super athletes and making a whole fucking boatload of money. And then we'll finally see what's what. Like what what martial arts really work at the highest physical level plus the highest technical level at like the biggest size possible. Because that's the pinnacle of the sport. We haven't gotten there yet. It hasn't evolved there that will be the pinnacle of the sport in my personal opinion. And that's what I want to see. So I love your pipe dream, Eddie. That would be fantastic. It would, I love fights already. And then we add a, a high level of athleticism. I think nobody could disagree that that would be absolutely fantastic. I, my post fight bonuses are the same. Ngano, Benavidez, Dober. Uh, man, I, I would give one to Amanda Rebus. And Maurice Green. So I would skip your boy and go to Amanda Rebus and Maurice Green. Rebus be- because, uh, well, both, was Maurice Green an underdog? Maybe not. But Rebus was an underdog, a decent-sized underdog. And she goes out there. Uh, the women's fights, was, it was like minus 200 to, not, to go to the judges. She goes out there and kind of destroys Emily Spitfire Whitmire and then has the best post-fight interview of the night where she said, I'm a black belt in judo. I'm a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but I'm a white belt in speaking English, so I'm sorry that this post-fight interview isn't going to be that great. And then she went on to say a bunch of great stuff that I don't necessarily remember. But all around, I think that was a great performance. I've kept you for a super long time, Eddie. I can let you go to the sixth round, or you can do a WTF of the card, whatever you want to do. Oh, i got to do the WTF. It has to be the referee who just stood by as Eric Anders unnecessarily punished his victim who was already unconscious. That's not a foul on Eric Anders. Could Anders have stopped himself? Yes. Is it his job to stop himself? No, it is not. Is it is am I gonna fault him? No. If I'm a fighter and I'm booked against him, am I gonna be like, oh shit? Like if he if he gets me down and starts pounding on me, like he's not gonna stop. That's that's scary shit. Like that's that's some scary shit, and uh, perfectly legal. Uh, but the referee, like, it's not like he was out of position or anything. He was completely hovering over the action, just blatantly watching this dude get pummeled unconscious. And it's like, hey, bro, you're not a fan. You're a referee. Do your fucking job and stop the fight. I mean, it 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 wasn't like, it wasn't the worst the worst stoppage I've ever seen in terms of letting it go too long. But it, it was it was probably my WTF of, of the card for sure. Yeah, that was probably the the biggest WTF that we could have possibly taken out of this event. Quickly, did you see that Chaz the Scrapper Skelly, uh, pretty fun guy on Twitter, really cool guy in general. He's a fighter in the UFC. He said, call me crazy, and this might be controversial, but I'd rather take two extra shots than have the fight stopped early. And he's the fighter, I, I get that, but... That's why the referees are in there to protect them from themselves, and that referee 
uh, the guy, well, Vinicius Castro. Moreira. Yeah. Yeah, Vinicius Moreira Castro. He couldn't even defend himself. So, yeah, the referee. Well, no, he was unconscious. Yeah. So, so the it's referee hard to defend to yourself when you're unconscious. Right. So that's why the um, referee really needs to do a better job. It's like they're one. They, so they're there to enforce rules, which they don't normally do. Fence grabbing, groin shots. Sometimes they'll they'll talk talk to him, but they don't. They hardly ever take toe, points. They're toe main, grabbing. Yeah, the toe grabbing. Or toes grabbing the fence. Oh. We saw that tonight. Yeah, that happens all the time. And Michael Bisbing thought it was stupid, but but that's a another thing. Yeah, they almost never do that. So their one and only job is to protect the fighter, and he didn't do a very good job of that. I agree. What the fuck? Or, oops. WTF. Excuse me. I'm trying to not cuss so much on the show, Eddie. To that guy. Um, I, if I was to do a positive WTF of the card, it would be Jared Gordon in his post-fight interview where he said, Hey, I, I don't fight for myself. I don't fight for glory or money. I fight to spread the word that if you're going through a hard time, if you're dealing with addiction or you've dealt with addiction or... You've, you've dealt with some some physical abuse or something like that. There are people out there who, who want to help you. I love you. There, other people love you, and you, you can get help and you can get through this. I love that that's Jared Gordon's like path in life at this point, and I love that he uses his mic time after a, a nice victory like that over Dan Moret to, to say things like that on the microphone. So what the F, that was awesome. I almost got a tear in my eye. Almost, yeah. You gotta love when when fighters have giant hearts, inside and outside of the cage. It's always nice. All right, I'm gonna bounce out of here. I'm gonna go to the sixth round. Find me on Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. Find me over at BloodyElbow.com. Doing, I don't know what I do. What do I do over there? I don't know what you're doing. Do like Stuff. results and highlights and some vivisections for some cards and six rounds and interview sometimes and just have fun and enjoy enjoy my colleagues oh big shout out to zane simon for his birthday and big shout out to steph haynes uh follow her on twitter at crooklyn mma uh she just hooked me up with this awesome care package uh from haynes house it's her own little company it's like lotions and body gels and just awesome stuff so go check her out check out haynes house check out zane simon happy birthday dude remulac all right, I'm out. We'll see you later, Eddie. Thanks for being here, man. <clears throat> All right, fight fans. We are 37 minutes and 43 seconds into this post-fight show. Ordinarily, that's all the longer we go. Um, and that's most of the show being myself and with you guys as my co-host. I see that Rob Amon's here. Rob, let's go into your section of the show, which is known as Rob's Roster Cuts. Who do you think should be cut from the roster after tonight's night of fights? Is there anybody on the card who you'd like to see leave? I think off of the top of my head, and I, and this section isn't meant to be disrespectful. It's just kind of analyzing what we saw tonight, analyzing the fighters' records coming into tonight and then leaving tonight, analyzing how exciting they are like, like Dana White would, even if somebody like Elias Theodoro is out there winning more than he loses, but doesn't have a great a great track record of uh, having exciting fights, who do you think should leave? Before we get into that, the official post-fight bonuses went to Nganu, Benavidez, Alonzo Menafield, and Eric Yaboy Anders. There was not a fight of the night. Thank you, June Williams, for providing us with that information. Let's see. Rob's roster cuts. Rob's butcher block. Vinicius Moreira, Dan Moret, and Junior Albini. That's who he thinks. Should be cut from the roster after tonight. I can definitely agree with Junior Albini. He's one and three. He's lost four in a row. His only win was his UFC debut against uh, Timothy Johnson. He lost a decision to Andre Arlovsky, and then he's been finished three times in a row. Once in Ezekiel Choke and twice via TKO. So yeah, I think it's fine for Junior Albini to no longer be on the roster.
Platinum Mike Perry. Not the real Mike Perry, but in the comment section says, I notice a huge pattern when Eddie, Zane, and HH, I don't, I'm not sure who HH is, and, and HH guy, oh, um, Connor Rebush, pick someone to lose, they lack skill, they won't give the winner their fair dues, is what he says. He says, really biased, in his opinion, yada yada. I don't know. Did he, did he do that tonight? Any, I don't know. Maybe. Anyway, um, what else was Rob's roster cuts? Vinicius Moreira. Yeah, I think he's he's fine to go. Uh, he's looked terrible in both of his appearances. He got finished by Alonzo Menafield and now by Eric, your boy, Anders. I thought it was a weird matchup from your boy. And then his third one, Dan Moret. What's his record like? He had a pretty tight fight tonight against Jared Flash Gordon. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see. He's lost three in a row in the UFC. He's never had a win in the UFC. You're right. He's probably on the outs. Good call tonight, Rob Amon. What would your guys' WTF of the card be? And also, what would you give tonight's fights a rating between let's go one and ten how would you rate the card between one and ten so your WTF and then your rating Marcus McGahey I'm sorry that I haven't been involved in the chat as much tonight as I usually am um, we did a little different tonight with Eddie <clears throat> I love talking to Eddie perhaps in the future I'm gonna look to doing the show more focused on you guys the live chat I think that you guys like it the best that way, so I'm going to think about doing it that way in the future. I want to engage with you guys. I think it's a good time. While we're at that, please give the video a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. Rob says the referee from the Maya versus Rocco Martin fight gets the WTF of the card. Yeah, he should have stood the fight up way before he did in the second round, in my opinion. I agree with you, Rob. Uh, Oin Dieck or One Dieck. Andy, I'm gonna call him Andy. Says 10 out of 10. WDF would go how fast? And Ganu ended the fight. Priam Alemian says Brian. After tonight's loss, how long do you think Junior Dos Santos has around anymore? You know, I think he like getting knocked out by Francis and Ganu should not be indicative of. You know, how much longer you have in the sport. Francis Ngannou melts almost everybody. And I think that Francis Ngannou has a good chance of melting Stipe Miocic in a rematch. That's just my opinion. I think that he's got a swagger back. Uh, he's training with guys like Marty Usman, Kamaru Ma Usman. So even though he's way smaller, he's working on his wrestling. You know that to be true. I like Ngannou's chances in a rematch with Miocic. Uh, anyway. Dos Santos, he was on a three-fight win streak against uh, Blagoy Ivanov, Tai Tuivasa, and Derek the Black Beast Lewis. I'd say we could probably see five more fights, three three to five more fights in Junior Dos Santos' career. His next one, I like. I would like to see him against the winner of Curtis Blades versus, I think it's Shabdul uh, Abdurakhimov, if I'm not mistaken. Or, or... Alexi Olenek. Junior Dos Santos versus Alexi Olenek next. I think that would be a great freaking time. Marcus McGay, he says he gives it a 9 out of 10. Priam gives it an 8 out of 10. Good night of action. <laughs> Sinski, the prodigy, I want to see Francis destroy Brock Lesnar, don't we all? Uh, Nathan Cohen, hey buddy, what's up man? Good to see you here. Card got a 9.2 out of 10, the WTF of the night is for him, from him, from Nathan. Says Bisbing creaming his pants over a jab in the Dolce versus Townsend fight. That was hilarious and totally uncalled for. That's kind of a WTF moment, I'll give that to you. Mike Perry says DC is the only one that has a chance against Ngannou. 
Rob says that JDS should mull retirement, and Priam likes JDS versus Alexio Linux. I think that'd be fantastic. What if Alexio Linux submitted Junior Dos Santos with a with a Ezekiel choke? That'd be amazing. Rob said that the Knights card gets a six out of ten. I would give the Knight of Fights. It ended pretty good. The co-main event was good. The one before that, Damian Maya versus Rocco Martin, I thought was awful. I'm sorry. I want to be positive. I, I don't want to be a curmudgeon, but I thought that fight was terrible. The third round, Damian Maya, I don't think threw a single strike. It's it's a mixed martial arts fight, and the guy's not throwing any strikes. He he landed or landed three significant strikes the whole time, ran all of the round three, just laid on Rocco Martin in, in staff pose in round two. That fight was awful. I give it a 7 out of 10. 7.5 out of 10. I think that should that should be good enough. Um, a, a WTF like positive that we could give the card or a moment on the card is Ricardo Hamish against Journey Newsom, Newsom on the last fight of the prelims, which was also on ESPN, even though the main card was on ESPN. Ricardo Hamish landed two spinning back elbows on J Journey Newsom. The first one just clicked his teeth, like barely got him. Newsom didn't even react to it. Well, he reacted, but he did, like didn't look affected at all. Then, is my mic too too hot? Then, in the third round, Ricardo Hamish got him like behind the mouth on the jaw, and Newsom went down for like a brief second, got right back up. What the f? That guy has a sweet chin. He had a very dynamic game. He hurt. Ricardo in the in well throughout the fight with low low kicks the, the outside low calf kicks and in the very end of the fight he had Ricardo Hamish hurt very badly with it. Um, Newsom kept throwing these like half spinning back fists that were cool looking. Uh, he's got wrestling, he's got boxing, he's got a well rounded skill set. He's kind of small. He looked really small against Ricardo, um, but I'm excited to see his next fight. You know, it's, it's not going to be a main card, and I'm not going to be like jazzed about it. But Journey made a great account of himself on short notice in his UFC debut. Bravo and to Jordan Newsom and what the F to his chin. Sinski the prodigy says Francis is never gonna lose again. I don't think that's true, but he's certainly doing some great things right now. Hey, what do you say we get out of here for tonight? Uh, let's go all watch the post-fight press conference and mull it over while talking about it on Twitter. Oh, Jackson Rounds says I'm super late, but a lot of finishes. Eight is a lot of finishes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So he's giving it an eight for a lot of finishes. Solid. So there was, there was more finishes than there were decisions, which is pretty darn good. And the only female fight, which they tend to go to a decision, all three of them did last week, the only one was a finish so that was pretty fantastic good night of fights really maybe i'll up mine to an eight anyway i'm gonna get out of here for tonight guys please give the video a thumbs up please please do that my goal is a hundred thumbs up on this video if you could help me out with that it would mean a lot to me follow me on twitter at flying brian j follow me on facebook at flying brian show on youtube youtube.com forward slash flying brian j and i'll see you guys next week for ufc 239 i will give my best darn play-by-play -play that i can muster during the main card portion and then of course i'll be right back here for the post fight show thanks again guys and you have a great evening namaste or go to sleep <laughs>